Roberta. Thank you, Laura. So, Roberta and I were having an interesting conversation about business plans. You want to know what a nice girl's business plan looks like? Here's what it looks like. If I'm really, really nice, and if I'm really amenable, and if I don't make waves, and if I don't make any kind of demands, and if I volunteer, and if I go the extra mile, and if I take one for the team, and if I take the crappy office, and if I act really, really humble, then people are going to like me, and I'm going to make money. Oh my God. Okay. Oh my God. How does that business plan oh sound? So How bad. does the business plan sound? <laughs> does that sound like you're going to make money? No. 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 You can't pay that long in a divorce well, no. <laughs> okay. So we're here to talk about why you need to cut the nice girl crap, not only in your business and in your life but why it is going to send you into the ground, why you will never, ever, ever get ahead. And so nice girls have this fear that if they're not nice, that means that they have to be a bitch. But the opposite of nice is not mean. The opposite of nice is not being a bitch. The opposite of being nice is being kind. Who can tell me the difference between nice and kind? More sincere. Nice is very superficial and it's what people want to hear. Yeah. Kind is the truth. Yeah. Kind is not always easy, but kind is doing the moral thing. It's letting people know where they stand with you. It's letting them know what you really think and feel so they can act accordingly. Nice is about manipulation, and nice is about fear. And so, you know, we can usually spot the nice girls. You ever go into a mall and you're going into a store and you walk in and you are immediately, you can, you, you're three feet in and you can spot the nice person. Who, what do the nice girls do? How do you spot them in the crowd? Anybody, how do you spot the nice girl in the crowd? Alice, you spot a nice girl a mile away. What do they do? I have no idea. Ah, then let me tell you. The nice girl smiling so hard, you think her face is going to break. And she comes up to you and she is looking for a thousand ways to make your life easier. She's running and she's moving your pocketbook for you. And she's running and she's making sure that she is not offending you somehow. And a nice girl is doing the song and dance because she does not want you to look too closely. If you are nice, you get invited to the table. If you are nice, you get the jobs. If you are nice, you get the promotion. If you are nice and deserving, you get what you want from other people. Because you don't think you can give it to yourself. So I'm a, um, a writer and um, I teach people how to, to write books on top of how to say no and how to cut the nice girl crap. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sharing a few stories with you and I'm going to make a few points because people don't remember facts. I could, you know, talk about 20% of people in this room are no doubt nice girls, but that, that it's meaningless. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories and make a point because you never want to make a point without a story. You never want to tell a story without making a point. You remember this in your own business when you're speaking to people. So my husband and I, we give, we give all sorts of talks. And we, um, we're giving a talk somewhere. And somebody came up to me after. And you know she'd heard that I do coaching. And she said, listen, I'd really like to talk to you. I, I am so um, impressed with the way you and your husband interact with each other. You can tell the guy really, really loves you. You guys have a really great dynamic. And I'd like to open up the hood and take a look at what you're doing. I want to know what you're doing because I'd like to be able to create that in my own relationship. So we step aside and talk for a few minutes. And she said, look, I got this, I got this great boyfriend. He's this Jamaican dude. And he really, really digs me. You know, the Jamaicans, you know, they're interesting because they, re they really like big women. And she's kind of, kind of showing me that she's a big girl. And she said, this guy, I'll tell you, he'll buy me these little flimsy ne negligees. And I'm, I, I take it out of the box, and I'm like, you want me to wear what? 
And she says, yeah, you got to, baby, got to wear this negligee. You got to wear it. She says, I'll put it on. I'll come out of the bedroom. And he'll be like, oh, baby, you look hot. She said, he's like, he's mad for me. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm not really seeing the problem here. Things sound pretty good to me. So she keeps talking. And she said, listen, you know, here's, here's the deal. We'll be, we'll be in the bedroom. And the phone will ring. We'll be in the middle of making love, and that phone rings. And he picks up the phone. And he's, you know, answers the phone. This has happened on several occasions, and I can hear on the other end, it's a girl. And he gets out of bed, he runs to the other room, and he's talking to her, and I hear him. He's saying, yeah, baby, I gotta, I gotta finish up something I'm doing here. And I'll be over in 20 minutes. And so this man comes back into the bedroom. She's laying in bed. He gets dressed. And he leaves, not one time, not two. This is happening all the time. <coughs> so she says, I want you to help me win him over. Why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> right. Why? So I ask her a coaching question, because we ask coaching questions. So why? Would you want to keep a guy like this? This guy does not sound like any kind of keeper. And she turns around, and she spins herself around, and she says, who else would want this? Who else would want this? So somewhere down in her mind, she has decided that it is easier to win this man over, to do what it takes to bring this man back to her so he can keep giving her that, hey, baby, you're hot feeling. So she does not need to go out and do the work required to make herself feel like, hey, baby, I'm hot. She thinks that it is easier to get that from somebody else rather than to create it for herself. This is the mindset of the nice girl. This is the mindset. You cannot get from other people those things that you must get from yourself. It is hard work to show up at a gym and to work month after month, year after year, to become the person you feel you need to become the stuff you don't want people to see. You're dancing as fast as you can that other people don't notice it. It is hard work to do it, but it's so much harder to be getting this from other people, to be held hostage, to have your leg in that bear trap. So how we do one thing is how we do everything. And this is a very horrible statement to say, especially if you saw my desk. <laughs> so I, um, I had a coaching client, it's a male. I do work with nice guys, too, not just nice girls. And um, if, you, if he's recently divorced, so if anybody's looking for a nice guy, got a nice guy. He's really nice. He's really nice. So Chris. He uh, was working as an accountant a few years back in a large manufacturing company out in New Jersey. And he had it in his mind that he wanted to be CFO. He was working beneath the CFO level. And he was one of these forensic accountants that goes in, looks at other people's businesses, decides if their books are in order, all this bean counter stuff, and then gives the information to the head of the company to, to decide if this is a good buy. They need him. They're putting him in. They're flying him to Michigan, flying him all over the place. And he knows he's valuable. And he's decided on his own, without ever having a conversation with the powers that be, that he is going to show up and work late every single night. He is going to be the one in his department that comes in on weekends and does the numbers for the end of the month number crap that you have to do as an accountant. Nobody else is ever there. And each week, each month, he's working harder and harder and giving more and more and more, never, ever once having the conversation on top of it. He wants a CFO position. He's decided that he's going to need to get an MFA to get that, or, or um, I should say an MBA, to get that position. Works super hard. His wife is pissed. He's never home. He's, ne he's never uh, attending the kids' meetings. He's thinking he's keeping his head low at home because you know, it's going to pay off in the end. He's, he's going to get this big promotion. His wife's going to be happy. Things are going to be great. He can just keep pedaling, pedaling, pedaling this way. Five years goes by. He's working it, working it, working it like the nice guy. 
the CFO goes and they immediately give the position to somebody from outside, somebody who's charismatic and assertive, who has been networking with the president of the company, and Chris is out on his ass, and Chris comes to the stark realization that he is a worker bee. Mm -hmm. Chris is a worker bee. Mm -hmm. And he feels used. And he goes home and he starts talking the, the victim language and his wife looks at him and she's out of there. She's out of there. And she's not out of there because he didn't get the job. He's out of there because of all the stuff he'd been ignoring and not facing. And why did Chris not go in and clarify the intentions of the company? He did not understand one important thing. You do not get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. And people pleasers, we think we're going to get the payoff. We're going to get what we deserve because look at what we are willing to do. And to have that clarifying re conversation requires that you show up, you put yourself out there, you dare to sound pushy, you dare to sound greedy, you dare to sound like you think you're good enough for it, and that's scary. And on top of that, you suddenly get the list of things that you have to do, the requirements, they're spelled out, it's no more guesswork, and you might not want to do it. Then you got to make a decision. And nice people, we don't like change. We don't like having to make a decision. We like things to go our way, but we don't want to have to really pay too close attention to these things. We don't want to have to look at reality. We don't like reality checks. Here's the other thing Chris missed. We do business with people we like and respect. He got the like part of the equation down. He did not get the respect part. As human beings, we do not respect those people who do not respect themselves. And you spot the people who are not respecting themselves. They are not part of the equation. They are not putting it out on the table what their needs are. They're, they're, they're not even expecting it. We don't want to do business with people who cannot take care of their own needs, who cannot manage their own needs, who do not even put that in as part of the equation. We don't want to deal with that in business. We don't want to deal with that at home. You sure as shit don't want a guy who does that. So I love pointing fingers at people and talking about, can you believe that? He doesn't know what he's doing, but I do. So I, I'm going to tell you why I'm not up here talking about how to fix your LinkedIn profile and why I'm up here talking about why you have to cut the nice girl crap if you ever want to be successful. Do you ever dare to be successful? So I grew up in an alcoholic family. My dad was one of these people who worked at Pratt & Whitney. We used to call it Pratt & Whiskey when we were a kid, because he'd come home and he'd be like, he hated that job. He was this farm boy from North Dakota and all these Easterners, damn it, man, they were out to get him. And he would walk in the house and my brother and I, we would look up. And he, you know, he's like this ticking time bomb in Anderson little trousers. You know, he comes in and we're like gauging one finger up in the air. How is it gonna go tonight? How is this shit gonna go down? And you know, he'd come in and we'd be like, hi, everything's great. Everything's great, 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 great. No problems here, busy, 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 we're just doing our thing. So we got very, very good at solving our own problems. We got very good at looking like everything's A-OK. -okay. We got very good at gauging what other people want from us. That's how we control things. Giving people what they want so they give us what we need. That's the whole game. So I, I come home from school one day, I'm maybe 10 years old, and I tell my mother, look, Mom, I just learned what an alcoholic is. Dad's an alcoholic, you need to leave. We are, we're in for a shit show here, Ma. We gotta get out of here. And my mother's like, Dad's not an alcoholic. You know, he doesn't drink at work. And, you know, alcoholics are skid row bums. You know, look at our nice house. I'm like, no, Mom, you know, here, you know, here's what an alcoholic is. And no, and I see my, you know, he's moody. 
Daddy's moody. And so one day I'm pushing her and she said, look, here's the truth. I don't have a college education. I got two kids to support. Where am I going? I got a decent provider. You know, things are good most of the time. Just there's nowhere for me to go. Without this dude, in other words, I'm screwed. So, you know, without knowing it, without realizing it, we, from our families of origin, we pick up certain rules. You know, my, my family was classic dysfunctional, and these same kind of dysfunctional rules are the same thing with, you know, other dysfunctional families, and even some subcultures and religions where, you know, these, these rules are, you know, don't talk. And so I put together just a couple of notes on, you know, what kind of rules you walk away with and see if they don't sound awfully familiar based on what we're talking about right now. So do not tell anyone what you really think or feel. Don't tell the truth. Don't air dirty laundry. Ignore your gut. Don't ask for help. Be perfect. Kind of a, okay. Yeah, it's a little long. So I head out into the world with, with my rules. And for many of you, you may, might not know, I lived in Iran for five years. I was married to an Iranian. I moved to, to Iran with him, and it was five years. It was a shit show. But before I moved to Iran, I, we lived in Washington, DC. And I was a uh, research toxicologist. He was getting his postdoc at National Institute of Health. I was 24 years old. My husband comes home, and he goes, I've decided I'm going to take a second wife. <laughs> like, what? I, uh, you know, he, he went into the story. He'd, you know, been getting phone calls from his old girlfriend. This is the woman who had put him through graduate school, another American, an older American woman. She'd heard we'd gotten married, and she was insane. Like, you know, you, you, had, you tied up all of my childbearing years, and you've gone ahead. You swore you would never marry, marry an American. You've got this American woman, and I, now I can't have kids. And being the noble man, he decided that he was going to fix his problem, <laughs> fix his mess. He had created this mess, so he's going to take responsibility for it. He said, so I've decided, you know, as a Muslim, it's within my right to have another wife, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to satisfy my responsibility to this woman. And you know, you can see this is a kind of a long story. But to make a long story short, I, after a couple of days of screaming and crying, I relented. I'm like, okay, here we go. And so he went down or back to Connecticut, got this woman, brought her up, set her up in her own apartment. One night he would go with me, one night he would go with her, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to wait this out. I'm going to wait this out because nobody in their right mind would hang around for this. You want crazy? Oh, honey, I can do a crazy contest. You want a crazy duel? I can win crazy. And so this stuff carries on for six months. And in this six month period, I never tell another living soul what is going down in my house. I act like everything's perfectly fine. Absolutely normal. Yes, I, you know, I develop an eating disorder, but you know, it's a great diet. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't talk anymore, but you know what? I was too chatty before. And so I don't tell people this because I know they're going to take one look at me and they're going to say, what kind of person hangs around for this? And it's clearly someone with zero self esteem. And who the hell wants to admit that? We don't want to admit we have zero self-esteem. And I'm hanging in there for a couple of reasons. I worked way too hard to get this guy to marry me. I worked so hard to get, I got myself pregnant, I, I miscarried, I, I, I upturned apple carts, I had been married for about 15 minutes to somebody, divorced him so I could marry this dude. I had created so much shit, but worse, other than you know, not wanting to release from the initial investment, you know, ROI, it is that I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to take the next step. I had a job, I had friends, I had all that shit, I had a chemistry degree, I did not know what to do without this guy. I was nothing without this man. He was my identity, he was my purpose, he was gonna do it for me. 
It was going to do it for me. I wasn't going to have to make any decisions or take any risk. He was going to do it for him. Me and I was going to follow along. So I was not going to release my fingers off of that. This is the man I followed to Iran. She left this chick thinking that I had won him over. I was, you know, every night I was, that he was home with me, it was making the nice dinners, looking good, never once talking about the rage inside or the, or the insanity inside, always keeping the game face, the game face, the game face. And the chick left because, not because I had won him over, because she ended up in a mental institution. But that's another story. <laughs> Sometimes we look to other people to give us something we think we cannot get for ourselves. We think they're going to give us a false sense of security or an identity or they're going to give us the success. We're going to ride along on their coattails. We'll get the promotion. They'll bring us in. They'll see what we're doing. They'll bring us in on the good stuff because we're like putting up with so much shit. They owe us. They owe us. The nice girl stuff is about fear. It's about doing things so people owe us. So the question is, how do you go from that to someone who can stand and tell you about the time her husband took a second wife? How do you do that? So I'm a chemist. I love chemistry. Actually, I don't love chemistry. I, I got into chemistry because I wanted to impress some guy. <laughs> and he was. He was really impressed. So worked out. But as a chemist, we like equations. And I ran into equation the other day, and it suddenly made sense how I got self-esteem, which is what is missing when you are a people pleaser. It is what is missing. And the equation goes like this. Self-esteem equals success divided by pretensions. This is a, a, an, uh, an equation from 1890 put out there by the father of psychology, William James. So pretensions is a little bit of an old-fashioned word. So I'm going to tell you how I, how I dise dis dis dissect and uh, define this. Success. If you increase the success, it's in the numerator, you do things that impress yourself. You wow yourself. You do something that you never thought yourself capable of doing. You do things that are hard, that are uncomfortable. That is the definition, as I read it, of success. The, the uh, denominator means that you need to lessen this stuff. You drop pretensions. You stop pretending to be somebody that you are not. You stop freaking faking it. You start owning what you think and feel, what you need, who you are, instead of pretending everything's OK. So the success part came for me when I started running. I come back from um, Iran. I put on 20 pounds right away. And I didn't like being fat. It made me insecure. And I, I started running. And it started out as being a weight loss gimmick. And it ended up being a spiritual transformation. Because I got out there, and for the first time, I had space to think. And I could see myself getting better and better at something. I didn't think I was a runner. But each time, I would run a little bit further and a little bit further, and there was a way of kind of measuring it. So it was like laying out in front of me, like, oh, I couldn't do it. And now, look, I could do this much. That's pretty impressive. And so I ended up running a marathon. I got talked into it by some running buddies. And they said, come on, you got to run a marathon. I'm like, who the hell is going to run a marathon? That's crazy town. I'm not going to run a marathon. You know how run a marathon? It's like 26.2 miles. That's crazy. Nobody's going to do that. I'm busy. i got kids. i got another job. i got little. So I, I did it. I ran the Hartford Marathon. And by the way, I'm training a whole bunch of girls, women, for their first marathon associated with um, New Horizons. And I absolutely adore it. 
because I'm seeing these women become superwomen. I'm seeing right before my eyes these women becoming superwomen. So I'm running my first marathon, I'm by myself. I come around the bend on Bushnell Park and I see the little archway into Bushnell Park. I got 0.1 miles to go and I come around and I see the finish line. And somebody's standing there with a silver blanket, somebody's standing there with a medal, and I burst into tears because I fucking made it. Yes. I fucking made it. And I had overcome doubt and pain and anxiety and every freaking obstacle you could throw in my way, not just the 22, 26 miles, but the four or five months of training, the blisters and the raw feet and all the canceled babysitter and running in 90 degree heat when I think I'm gonna pass out. All that shit that got thrown at me, I got through it. I saw one problem after the next, I got through that problem and suddenly I saw that you don't have to know how you're going to get there. You just have to start. You just have to start. And all of a sudden you start and you turn around and you realize you've done it. This, the whole reason I couldn't walk away from that marriage is I didn't know how to start. I didn't know how it was going to go down. So I cross that finish line and it's a switch. Switch got turned on. The switch got turned on and I realized, I don't need people to approve of me. Because I think I'm hot shit. I am hot shit. Holy shit, I'm hot shit. Look, look at me, look at me. <laughs> and it became my touchstone. I would go back to it when I needed to know that I was going to get through this huge project or this big transition. I, I bought a house, I started climbing mountains, I got remarried, I started doing all these amazing things. I bought a house in Ireland, I don't know how to do this shit. Work both places, but I'm doing it. I don't know how I'm doing it, I'm doing it, figuring it out. I decided to go back to school, I went to, I applied to Harvard and I got in. Writing program. And this is where the second part came in. The second part about dropping the pretensions, about stopping the show, the song and pony, the dog and pony show you're doing for everybody else, and figuring out who you really are and what you want. Because I didn't know. I'd start writing these stories about all the, <laughs> what people did to me in Iran, and all, how horrible it was, and look at what these people did to me. And you know, people in the class would be like, so you know, what were you thinking? What are you doing? Why would you do that? Would, and I'm like, oh, no, can you see? Oh. Then I had to start thinking about, okay, all right, well, what, what happened? What happened? And the more I looked and the more I played with these ideas and the more I wrote about these feelings and thoughts and events that I had always been ashamed of, that I did not want people to know about me because if they knew the real me, they would run for the hills. They'd run for the hills. And suddenly I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, shit, no wonder things went down this way. I get, I get it. I get why it went down this way. I get why it went down this way. And I forgave myself. And I thought, shit, you know, this is who I am. This is actually who I am. And I'm quirky as the day is long and I'm intense and I have all this this crazy nutty stuff in my background, but it's okay. And you know when you start getting things to go your way? When it doesn't matter so much what other people think. It doesn't matter so much what other people are willing to give you, because you figure out you get to do that for yourself. You get to create that for yourself. But the key is, which I invite you to consider, you need to fix what needs to be fixed. No one else is gonna cover that shit up for you. It's not easier if somebody else kinda does that for you. The cost is so high, I cannot even tell you. You need to get to know your true thoughts and feelings and desires. You need to become part of the equation. People will respect you when you are part of the equation, when you are assertive 
when you tell the truth, when you let them know where you stand, where you charge for your services, where you can have the money conversation, where you can ask for the promotion and say, I want this, what do I need to do? And you decide whether or not it's worth it for you. That is how you cut the nice girl crap, and that's how you succeed. I was at the gym the other day, and I see the lady with the Jamaican boyfriend. She's at the gym. She'd hired a uh, personal trainer, and she was on the floor doing planks, and the sweat was pouring off of her, and I walked up and clapped. So I want you to know that I'm still a total approval whore, and I need the adulation of telling me how great a job I just did. Yeah. <laughs> Would anybody like to ask some questions? Or have I been perfectly brutally clear? <laughs> It's funny listening to you talk like that because that's what my husband always is telling me, but hearing it from him is so difficult. Mm -hmm. And like having his words come out of my mouth feels so strange. Yeah. And it's like, when you I get, do it, it's not. It's I bet not you me. get super, super defensive when you hear oh, it. Mm -hmm. have no idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the clue to where you got to work, the clue is where you get defensive. I'll get defensive. Someone will say something to me, and here's the truth. We, people judge in us what we judge in ourselves. So when that defensiveness comes in, the what, how dare you say that? It's, it's where the truth lies, and that's where the work lies. And it's, it's not easy work. It's facing into some stuff you don't want to believe about yourself, but it's good. It's good. It's all good. My uh, soft spot is obviously the kids and volunteering and that's the hardest thing because I'm always like you know well if I'm not gonna do it who else is gonna do it and we have a, a fundraiser tonight that basically I just said to the HSA president if I don't get volunteers I'm canceling it I and mean, what am I what else am I gonna do and she's like well we can't so now I'm like okay here it is again me coming up with creative solutions to a fundraiser that I'm putting my all in and nobody else is kind of contributing so let me so, ask you a question yeah, yeah what happens if it gets canceled um, people go there and the school doesn't get money, <laughs> right? Right, and then what? And then, well, I'm, I'm always thinking that it looks bad on me because I'm the one that organized it. So, yeah. This, and, we, and we all get hooked into this. I mean, just, um, we all get hooked into this. <laughs> we all get hooked into it. And then what happens? If it doesn't go down the way people expect, and then what happens? Then what happens? Then what happens? You follow that line until you realize that what happens does not actually constitute a national emergency. Yeah. I want to become close, but no. <laughs> because when you're doing it, nobody else has to pick up. Nobody else has to pick up the end. You you got it covered. You let it fly. You let it flop. You let it fail. If it's important enough to other people, that someone else is going to pick it up. Right. Doesn't have to be you. So that's it, girls, ladies, women, super women, powerhouses. Thanks, Anne. You're welcome. You. You're welcome.